Oli, welcome to the show. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. And for those who are uh, not watching on YouTube, your studio is is pretty amazing. We'll get into that. Guys, Oli and I met on TikTok Live. This is like the umpteenth guest that I've met. He came to one of my lives and we started talking about his business and he was a perfect fit, fit for the show. And I said, well, you got to come on, right? Because people got to hear this story. So before we get into the multiple businesses that you've started and the one that you're focusing on, you got a couple that you're focusing on right now, give the listeners here a little bit of context, a little bit of background about your W-2 job, because you do have a W-2 prison break story. We definitely want to hear that. So give us the juicy details on that, Oli. Yeah, for sure. I had a W-2 job, and like you said, and I was in sales. It was like my real hated it the most W-2 job, and I... I was selling trailers like horse trailers and cargo trailers and stuff like that. And I just hated it. My boss was just like, he was a real jerk. He really made me cry like almost every single day. And I just couldn't handle it anymore. I was so sick of it. I had decided to like go back to school and try to figure out something else. And then in the middle of that, I got my, I'd always wanted to be a photographer. I'd always wanted to take pictures since I was a little kid. I always wanted to have a good job so I could afford a good camera because I thought it could only be a hobby. Everybody always said, if you want to make money with a camera, sell it. And and I thought that sounds miserable, but I want to create, I want to do things with a camera. And so it sounds like I have to have like a real good job so I can afford that camera. And I was, I was at the courthouse. I was selling, I was like, I did the horse trailer selling thing and that was just so miserable. And then when I went to college, I got this internship and it was a great, supposed to be a great internship, but I just couldn't stand it. I was in the courthouse. I was studying to be a landman and sell oil and gas properties and stuff like that. But I was in the courthouse every day, hunched over with my iPhone over these courtroom documents and, and property documents and going through with my iPhone and, and every, I look around and everybody else has like a real camera. So I told my parents, I was younger then, just in college. I told my parents I was going to save up and buy a camera and do what everybody else is doing because if this is going to be my profession, I don't want my back to hurt every day. And that was just a miserable job. I hated being in there. I got that camera and the boss said, oh, I don't want you to use that. And I'd already taken it out of the box. I'd already used it. I didn't even ask her. I didn't even think to ask her. I was, it was just miserable. And so I went back to using the phone and my parents said, we have a barrel race coming up. So I was like a horse rodeo photographer. And they said, why don't you come shoot this barrel race? The team rope and photographer, he's going to show you the ropes and he'll show you what to do or whatever. And it's in two weeks. <laughs> so I said, that was really scary. I pushed back a bunch, but they talked me into doing it. And that day, that weekend, whatever, two weeks after I got my first real camera, I had no idea what to do. I spent every waking hour after work, even before work, I'd fall asleep laying in bed and my iPad would whack my face because I'd drop it and fall asleep. And so I was trying to learn photography as fast as I could because I knew I needed to know something at least for this other guy to teach me the rest. And then he didn't show up. So I just had to do it all on my own. I was just flying by my coattails here and I had no idea what to do. So I figured out this little system that we had. Those first two days, I worked four hours each day. So I worked eight hours and I made more money in those two days working eight hours total than I did the last 40 hours of work. That was like my light bulb moment. Oh, I could just work weekends and make more than I am working at my W-2 job that I hate anyway. And so I could do something where I'm creative and I'm outside and I'm out enjoying the life. And, and people are like, they're handing me money and saying, thank you. And they are like, so just amazed that I can do this. And we were printing on site and nobody else is doing that. And it was like this thing, like nobody told me I couldn't do it. So I just did it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And it sounded like it didn't go. So you're doing something you love, which is photography. You, you finally got to that point. A couple of things happened. Like the guy didn't show up, like you mentioned. So you had to figure it all out on your own. And that was probably nerve wracking for you. Was it as bad as you had maybe made out in your, in your head or because we, we do that. We tell ourselves the stories like, oh, I'm not good enough or this is going to this is going to be a disaster. Like maybe touch on that if you had any of those doubts or self-limiting beliefs. Yeah, for sure. I was building my parachute on the way down. It was trying to I'd hired a person to help me and I was trying to teach them something that I hadn't even learned myself, which was editing and printing photos. I had no idea what to do there. 
And I didn't really know how to take pictures that well either. And then one of my friends that was a barrel racer, she walked up and she said, why don't you just hold the trigger? Because I was trying to time it out. I was trying to work on my timing from day one, which is crazy town. So I just went and we did what we call spray and pray. And we would just spray a bunch of images and hope one turned out right. And then that really boosted my sales and we sold a lot then. But it was just like every little thing I needed to learn all the different ways to operate the camera, the aperture, the shutter speed, all that stuff within two weeks and try to figure it out. And luckily I did learn pretty quickly and I made a lot of mistakes. And of course, like months and years down the road, I changed completely all kinds of things that I was doing that first day. But I still look back on some of those first images when they were the ones that did sell, the people did go ahead and pick. They were pretty decent, but didn't it, it wasn't that hard at the end of the day to go ahead and take some pictures and send them to the booth and have people look at them on. I went to my living room, right? Shot my house and I grabbed a card table that I had and I grabbed the TV from the living room and plugged that into my laptop. It was just, we just really bootstrapped it from the very beginning. Yeah. And you're applying this to, to photography, but you can really apply this to really any industry yeah. that you go in that you have a certain level of of passion about. Hey, I've, I've always wanted to do this thing. I love it. I, I just don't think I'm good enough or I need to know everything. It has to be perfect. And what you're saying is that not only does it not have to be perfect, but the, the clients probably didn't even really know the difference. It was just all the projections that you had put on, but you, which you overcame, which is good on you. A lot of people wouldn't have even done it. They would have had to have everything would have had to have been absolutely perfect before they even went and did the barrel shoot. Oh, yeah, I know people that are been doing photography or whatever, insert whatever business for a decade or more, and they're just not quite ready to sell anything yet. And I was like, I've been doing this for two weeks, so let's give it a whirl. Let's just try and see if it works and, you know, throw stuff at the wall. And luckily for me, it's stuck. Okay, what you just said of people that you said decades that have been doing photography, they're not ready to sell anything yet. Why do you think that? Why do you think that's the case? I I just think like they have so much self-doubt and like fear and like the imposter syndrome or what all those key words there. But at the end of the day, they just think that people are are just thinking about them constantly and all the negative things and, and looking at all their mistakes. And people just aren't. People are also in their own world and they're just worried about themselves, just like we're worried about ourselves. And so for me, it's just put stuff out there and try to always improve. Like we're always improving, always getting better on the inside and then just just go for it just try it you'll never know if you don't take that step yeah that's really great i just thought of this too because you're basically looking at you're looking at it from one lens right literally because you're taking pictures yep. but your client is looking at it from a completely different lens maybe they're not seeing the imperfection in the photo that you're seeing because you're the expert and they're the consumer right they're like hey yep that picture looks pretty darn good. I'm not looking at this little little thing here or whatever. I mean, my wife uh, is a photographer as well. And I can cool. tell you she spends hours editing <laughs> and the yeah. end result is great. But I always tell her, I'm like, look, the client is not going to pick up on all the stuff that you're doing. Like they're just, yeah. as you said, they're just, they're looking at it from a different angle. And I think yeah. any business or anything that you're going after from a passion-based business, that's that's how you have to think of like, how is the person paying me the money looking at it, not how I look at it? Is that, right. that to resonate? Does that land with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, like I look at those and I think, oh, I should have shot that with a shallow depth of field when I should have focused here or whatever. And I shot it with like crazy, like F22, like maximum depth of field. So everything was in focus. The customers doesn't think about that. They're thinking about, look at my face. What's my face doing? Or here, my reins are over here, but like I should be in this position. Like they're thinking about themselves. I don't even yeah. know what you just said. So yeah, I'm a I know, photographer of the family. So <laughs> I just look at the photo like, hey, that looks pretty good. So how are you still doing the kind of, let's fast forward a little bit because you yeah. left the W2 and went full-time photography. Then just continue with the timeline in terms of what that turned into, because you're, I don't think you're just doing barrel shooting anymore. It turned into a lot of other cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We went in and, and we became one of the top photographers in the industry within a few years. And we've, we got up to making 325,000 a year and it had up to 15 employees at any given time. And that really did take off, but it really was taking a lot of my time 
we were traveling the country full time in an RV and just we were really getting after it. And then at the end of 2020, I decided to retire. And so we had our very last event photography shoot, like a rodeo kind of shoot at the end of 2020. And then we moved here to Phoenix, kind of Phoenix area. And now we live here full time. I went from spending my winters here and kicking my feet up for four months out of the year to now we live here full time and we run a Copper Cactus, which is our new handmade crafted business. We run that out of the garage and then we're still filming commercials and doing like photos for small businesses. So we went from like event photography to commercial videos and you said something really cool. It's like you scaled it up from zero to to over 300,000 in three years and 15 employees. And you're really getting after it. So you went from not knowing anything, like again, falling asleep yeah. on the iPad to three years later, you got yeah. this real business that's pulling in some good money and you're happy doing it, right? Like this yeah. is something that you enjoy doing. And you were also, it sounds like you were very targeted and specific as to what your niche was, correct? Yeah. So we subscribed to like the 80-20 principle. We figured out that 80% of our income is coming from 20% of our efforts. So we focused on that 20% of our efforts. So in that too, we did a, a different 80-20 analysis of our income every year. And we just dropped the bottom 20%. And we just kept the top 80%. And it was very quick to grow with that. So every time January came around, I went through my events. And I drew a line on my spreadsheet. And I said, these are the bottom 20 I called those producers and said, sorry, I'm not, I'm not coming back next year. Some of them offered to pay more. And so they bumped up. And so then we made more money with them. Or they just dropped out and said, yep, yeah, goodbye. It was great working with you. We appreciate the notice. And then I filled those in with even bigger ones. And those turned into the top 20% instead of the bottom 20%. So we grew quite rapidly doing stuff like that. Okay, great business tactic for sure. Was that something that learned on your own, figured it out? Did you have help with that? Because most of it don't understand what you just right, what you just said. You actually got people to pay you more on the bottom to become up to the top twenty. I learned that through four hour work week and books. I read a ton of books. Mm -hmm. I saw on your live you recommended a book, and I'm halfway through that now. But yeah, we're always like consuming so much content and like business books primarily, and trying to. I always tell people. Like I'm a businessman and I happen to do photography. I'm not a photographer that's like trying to do business. I'm always the other way around. So we always look at everything in a very like business lens first. And then we know we're creating good images, like the image quality is there and that's a base and we've got that handled. But then after you got that handled, you need to really focus on your business. And that's what we're doing at Copper Cactus too. We, we try to pump out really good quality products, but we're primarily focused on the business side of things. So let's talk about that. What kind of sparked the idea to go from, because it's not necessarily related to photography. So what sparked the idea? I love the business and I want to talk. I just yeah. want you to tell us all about it. And then I'll dive in with some more detailed questions because I think you're doing some cool stuff. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about transitioning earlier from my W2 to my Oli's Images stuff. But this is like the longest transition of all of them. Because like in 2014, what do I need to promote my business? I need caps and shirts and merch and whatever. And so I went out and got a bunch of quotes for them. And I realized like I could make that stuff myself. I could buy a cricket or whatever, some little plotter cutter thing. And I could make my own stuff and I could order the patches and I could apply the, the patches to hats. And then people saw that I was doing that back in 2014 and they started asking me to do that for them. So it was, it's been a little bit of a side project that's just grown and grown and grown until about 2019, then I started buying better equipment. So we've been transitioning to Copper Cactus since then. And then early this year, at the beginning of 2023, maybe end of 2022, we bought that laser that we use to do the engravings and stuff. And we decided, you know what, we need to like branch this off. We need to break this off from all these images. And it's no longer, it doesn't really fit. It doesn't make sense to the customer. And We've read a bunch of books and if you confuse the customer, you're going to lose the customer. So we branched that off and now we made Copper Cactus Handmade Goods and it's Copper Cactus Collective. But that has been since like 2014 that it's just slowly grown and we've been doing it for more and more people. And now it's time to just make it its own thing. You're going full steam ahead on that in terms of your energy, which is great. Talk a little bit about how your because again, I found you on TikTok. And if you go to if you go to your page, 
you're showing people how you make the product, which I yeah. mean, is brilliant. Number one, that, Hey, I have a business and this is how I make the stuff. And I assume that's a, a revenue driver for you. So maybe talk a little bit about the strategy there and why everyone should be doing that if they have a business or a product to sell. Yeah, I get a lot of customers like on my live, like you did. We get people watching me make stuff on live and asking questions. A lot of times it's other makers, so I'm more than happy to help them too. For the other makers, we have a links page. We've got digital files. We've got all kinds of stuff to help other makers. And we've divided Copper Cactus into the Copper Cactus Club. And that's going to be for our members. And we're launching like a member space soon. So you're the first to hear about that. And then we have like our Copper Cactus Collective, which is where we sell the goods with the actual products. So we'll help the makers when they have questions. We have like affiliate links. We've got all kinds of stuff there that generates some revenue there. And then we get curious customers that want to know how it's made. And just like the show, how it made, but a lot of people love to watch you make the thing. Even the TikTok videos that are short, like bam. They show you like engraving it for a second, clicking this, brushing that, wiping this. You get tons of those people that are like, wow, that looks really cool. And you are in fact making it by hand. It's not just some drop ship item from overseas or whatever. I made this and now it's for you. <laughs> nice. Now, yeah. is this a, I'm, I'm curious too, because you are making everything by hand. Is this a scalable business for you? Is this, I assume it is, but I would just be curious. How do you intend on scaling the business when it gets to the point where you want it to go? So right now we're fairly comfortable where we're at and we do feel ourselves bumping on that ceiling of, okay, we are running out of time. This is just me. Like Brenna works on our website stuff and she's doing a lot too. And she's making candles and we're doing a lot of stuff together. And it is one of those things where, okay, we are, we got to start planning the next move here because it is starting to grow. We are focused mostly on helping other businesses. We're doing wholesale stuff. So it's not necessarily so much of the designing one product and making one product for one person, because that takes a tremendous amount of time. But we're designing something once, creating a hundred or a thousand of the thing and, and then shipping that out. So we can do between me and the laser, we can pump out several hundred patches a day, 300 maybe, pretty comfortably and still stop at a reasonable time during the day and not go all night and all day. And I've been there and that's what we were doing with all these images. We were working sometimes 24 hours, 48 hours straight uh, without stopping at all. Like some of these events were just crazy. We would go all day and all night for weeks and we didn't like that. We burnt out. So we're trying really hard not to burn out again. And anything that we can do to offload some tasks, we have some virtual assistant kind of jobs that we have when I send stuff out to other people to get done and then send back in. We're just trying to outsource as much as we can and then use the laser. So between me and the laser, we got a pretty good system going and, and it works for now, but I can see where we're going to have to expand in the near future. The interesting thing that I'm finding here, and I, I love your feedback on it is if I go back to the timeline, you always wanted to do photography. That was yep. what you're passionate about. You got there and then you scaled it up and then you realized, okay, this is, I'm burned out a little bit, burned out. And I got to do this other business, which you, I would assume you did not ever see that. It just like gradually happened. How many ever years ago it was, 10, 10, 12 years ago, you didn't see this as the end result, did you? No, I didn't. No. Yeah. No, I just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because back when I started all these images, I thought I'm young and this is easy. I just sit here like I basically sit in one spot and just shoot the same pictures over and over for every contestant. Yeah. And I thought well, I could do this until I'm real old and real old came real fast. So yeah. it didn't take very long. And I was like, oh, this sitting all day in one spot is not great. When it was eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Fine. Easy. 12 hours a day sitting in a chair. No, not a problem. When we're going like 48 hours straight, when like we swap photographers a little bit, like I had some other photographers working for me too, but they don't, I, I don't know. I was having a lot of trouble finding somebody that could push the button the right way. I don't know. It was very, it's a very like niche skill, but for Copper Cactus, like now we can train an employee to do this stuff and we can, we can scale more sustainably, I think. So yeah. it's a, I think it's going to be a better business for us personally. It's already been a much better lifestyle. I've already lost 52 pounds since I quit photography. So just switching over, doing a different lifestyle is majorly beneficial for our health. 
<laughs> Super important. And you're saying, yeah. you know, I know you're having a good time doing it because I've you. seen your videos and you enjoy it. I'm the ruler leather bracelet is pretty cool. I've never seen that before, but this is obviously oh, a thing. People wear a ruler leather bracelet. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Adam Savage. I don't know if you remember him from Mythbusters. He yeah. tattooed one like a ruler on his arm and he had inches and, and centimeters and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's a great idea, but I don't want to tattoo real bad. So he makes like a temporary one, but like, why would I spend money on a temporary one? It's just going to go away. So I designed that one and I put some snaps on it and thought I already have a laser so it could be perfect every single time. And I can put it on my screen and make sure that, that it's accurate because what good's a ruler if it's not accurate? I already had the snaps laying around. So I had everything, had all the materials and I just thought, why not? Let's give it a shot. And people have been liking it. They've been, it's been well received and I just launched it what, last week or something. Yeah. I've been seeing the yeah. video. Super cool, super cool yeah. business. Just a great idea. And again, I love that you're out there telling people about your business and you've made these really awesome pivots. Like you, you have chapters and seasons to your life, It's but you took the first step, which was like, Hey, I'm going to do this barrel shoot. Right. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. And, and then fast forward, it's like, now look at you. Right. Well, what if you hadn't done that? Have you ever, th do you ever think about what if you said no to that opportunity? Yeah. All the time. I look at my friends that, especially while I was in photography and I'd recently made that branch, I look at my friends that were still doing the same thing. And, and even eight years later, 10 years later, they're doing the same thing. And yeah, they've grown their, in their companies and they've worked up and they finally have broken that six figure mark and then some. I broke that six figure mark within the first 12 months, within the first calendar year of of running my business and not even going full time. And then when I went full time, boom, doubled and then tripled. It was very quick. And so I was making way more money than my friends that were still stuck at their W2 job. Like my job at first it was barely plugging along and then it J curve and pretty quickly it got to be a lot. That's <laughs> for yeah. The old hockey stuff. stick moment, if you will. Yeah. Describe. So that's good. And that's just you being consistent. Yep. And like you said, go, going yeah. all in. All right. A lot of people listening, totally. They have something they're passionate about. They probably, and they were, I love that you told your story about you didn't really know what that, you probably didn't even know how to open up the, the, the box to the camera, let alone that like, <laughs> use it. Yep. So I'm being sarcastic, but oh, yeah. what it, for someone who's passionate about something, and then I, I love what you said, the, the, the analogy you made was like, the other way you're going to make money with photography is selling the camera. Yep. A lot, there's a lot of people that are talking very similarly about whatever their thing is. I'm not good enough. Yeah. I don't have enough knowledge. I'm too old, whatever it is. Yep. What's something that you would say to that group of people to maybe just get them over the line, if you will, because they're right there and they need to take the leap. What's some advice you would lend to that group? Some of it for me that like made me feel a little bit more comfortable was I looked at how much money I was spending anyway. What's my overhead? What's it take? on a regular month at, at my W-2 job or whatever to maintain the current lifestyle that I'm at right now. And then I made sure that I was 20, 30% more than that for my small business. And then it was very clear, okay, I'm making that much money in this business. This is a real thing and it can support my lifestyle right now. And I'm good. I hate this job <laughs> and I love this. So it was a gut-wrenching decision and it felt like unsafe, right? What's more unsafe, like I, so a lot of people, like my sister talks about all the time, I have security, I have job security. And like you have one boss ahead of you that says, I don't like you today, you're gone, you're out of a job. One, one person says you're out of a job, you're out of a job. For me, there's 7 billion people on this planet that need to tell me that they don't want to buy from me and I'm out of a job. Right. Like I have at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that have to say, we don't like your stuff. So I have so many more maybe bosses or whatever, but it's so much easier to stay employed because you have tons of customers. And like one of my customers dropped off the other day, I picked up three more the next day. So all of these, everybody in the world has to say no to you before you're out of a business. I love it. I love it. Perfectly said. How many, when you had your photography business scaled up to the hill, roughly mm -hmm. how many clients did you have? How many customers did you have? Oh, thousands. We were selling them to contestants. So at, at any event, there would be at least hundreds of, of customers. We would sell, yeah, yeah hundreds yeah. if not thousands at each event. And we were doing 
26 to 30 events a year. So we were basically going a little over six months out of the year and then taking the rest of the time basically off. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So, yeah. No, that just supports your point. Like when you have a W-2 job, you have one income stream. You had right. thousands of income streams. And if you lost a bunch of them, 20% of them, maybe more, yeah. you're not going out of business, right? Like you still right. have it. You still have income. So yeah, that's great advice. I just want everyone to understand that. Hey, look, there's... The risk is the W-2, folks. The risk yeah. of staying in the job and relying on somebody else yeah. to pay you, to be in charge of your financial flow. Awesome advice. Yeah, you're at their mercy. You know, when the boss says, well, sales are down, so like we got to make some cuts. I mean, I've had tons of my friends that just lost their job. They walked into work the next day and like their stuff was all boxed up and they were out or the company merged. Like they're doing so well that another company came and bought them out. And that company said, we don't need duplicates of everybody. So they slashed all these people. And you're just not going to have that when you're doing stuff like we're doing, where you're selling, where you're the boss and you're selling all the customers and you're going to stay in business, stay afloat. I think yeah. most people are afraid to be that person. Yeah. Like they're afraid to be the one that is responsible for not only themselves and their family, but uh, maybe I got I, I got other people that, I've, that are relying on me too. That could be pretty scary. For a lot of people. Yeah, especially at the beginning where it does feel like it's easy to fall off. Oh, we got to keep this going. But once you get that momentum going and you get more and more sales and you're making more income, pretty soon you're making two, three, four, five, six times what you were making at your W-2 job. So then suddenly it's, oh, now it'd be really hard to quit, right? It's hard to go the other way now because now you realize this is a better lifestyle and we are more flush and it is easier to pay the bills when we have so much more income coming in. I love it. Oli, let's think, give the website for anyone who wants to learn more about your business. Cause again, I think it's cool. I think your stuff's really cool. I'm, I, I want everyone else to know about it. So give the website where people can go to learn more. Sure. You bet. Thank you. It's copper cactus collective.com. Right. And that is, is that also your TikTok handle as well? Yep. So if you want to see how this stuff's made, Guys, this is legit stuff. Go to TikTok and look, hey, look, I'd never thought that as almost a 50-year-old guy that I would be on this app, but I've met some amazing people and you, you can really move the needle if you have a business on that app by simply just being out there. So I'm glad that happened. Before we wrap up, is there, are there any final thoughts that you have? Maybe something I didn't ask you that you're dying to get out of you before we let you go today. I don't think so. I think you did a good job of asking questions and we talked a little bit ahead of time and I think we covered all those things too. So I appreciate you and thanks for having me on here. Yeah, you bet. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the relationship continues. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Take that action, have that belief in yourself and I'll go make it a great day.